So, 1312, the uh, Templars were dissolved and many were executed um, for their uh, criminal uh, behaviour behind the guise of this uh, holy Christian order, which of course they weren't. Um, now, after that, something quite interesting happened here in Britain. Uh, in 1348, the Order of the Garter was formed. Uh, now, this was around the time of Edward III, and there were all sorts of um, myths about how this happened, to do with the garter being round uh, a lady's uh, leg and it falling off. Um, but actually, of course, the garter is a symbol, as uh, some people may know, in witchcraft. Um, it's very clear to me that this was just simply another order, rather similar to the Templars, that was being created. Uh, in fact, there are 26 knights uh, of the Garter, which equals two covens, two witches' covens. So it does look as if, ever since the time of Edward III, this Order of the Garter, which is uh, based in Windsor Castle, has been very much associated with the control of the British Crown ever since that time by uh, another, a different order, but along similar lines to the Templars. Through This is not a... Uh, they're, they're not there to protect the Crown... They are there to control the crown. And uh, <clears throat> there are many people, uh, if you can have a look at the list of today of people who are uh, members of the Order of the Garter, they're all sort of dodgy, suspicious characters. I don't think that there's any one single person who you could say is incredibly honourable and chivalrous and deserves that kind of role. So it's very difficult, I think, for the royal family to really be their own people with these 26 members of the Order of the Garter constantly uh, following them around and so-called protecting them. It's a kind, of, a kind of, you know, sort of protection you might get from gangsters rather than from uh, some honourable knights like, you know, something like the myth of the round table or whatever. Uh, OK, so uh, later on in the 1300s, we had the Peasants' Revolt. Uh, the situation in Britain was getting worse and worse, really heavy taxes. And down in Kent, uh, Watt Tyler and some of his friends got organised a uh, massive resistance and they took over large parts of London uh, and demanded various things from the king, uh, which uh, where, where they were promised that there would be uh, more, more um, kindness given by, to the peasants. But then, of course, the king uh, reneged on his promise and had Watt Tyler arrested and murdered. Uh, I would say murdered because I don't think it's justice. He was representing literally thousands and thousands of peasants uh, and trying to negotiate with the king. And, of course, the king, because he was powerful, reneged on the deal. Uh, OK, so that was 1381. Go forward a few more years to Martin Luther in Germany. That's 1520. Uh, this is where the Protestant Reformation started. Uh, and this is really strange because the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church, all, both of them are flawed. Of course, anything earthly is bound to be flawed. We've got problems with the Pope, but, but the problem with the uh, Protestant Church uh, under Martin Luther is that they seem to be rather more uh, anxious to admit uh, occultists to the Church than the Catholics had been. So whilst we get you know, the one bad thing with the Catholics, we've got other bad things with the Protestants. That was 1520. Uh, then 1535, we had a massive, massive changes here in Britain, the dissolution of the monasteries by Henry VIII. That was 1535 to 40. Now, this meant a massive change in the country because it meant that no longer were the monasteries going to be independent. They were all taken over and controlled by the king. This affected 900 different monastic communities across the country, uh, which was equivalent of about 9,000 monks and nuns. And... Of course, the big bonus for the king was this brought in £90,000 per year extra for the king. That was the real, I think, the real reason for the Reformation. It's because it meant that the king was now, in Britain anyway, was running things, not the Catholic Church. So uh, we move on a bit to a bit later in that century, and uh, 1549, um, there was something called Ket's Rebellion in Norfolk. East Anglia was ruled from under an oak tree by a landowner called Robert Kett. Kett had been a very f good friend of the peasants around that area, and he'd always been complaining when land was enclosed. We're going back to talk about land enclosure, privatisation again. Um, what happened when the land was enclosed was uh, it was privatised, it was given to a big landowner, and whereas they had had open fields before, fences and ditches went up and uh, there were all sorts of problems because the peasants no longer had land they could cultivate. 
often it was turned over to uh, sheep and, and livestock rather than people being able to grow their own food, being able to grow crops. So the rebellion lasts for about a month and a half, involved many thousands of uh, the local peasants, and actually they actually decided, oh, well, we can, Robert Keck can actually run East Anglia from under an oak tree, and he did. Uh, the landowners who'd been enclosing, privatising their land up until the rebellion, uh, many of them were arrested, and they were quite properly tried, questioned, and some of them were imprisoned for stealing the land. Uh, basically, the peasants were saying, well, look, you know, this is the very basic stuff that we need to live on, and if you're going to take it, privatise it, that's theft. And, uh, and uh, uh, anyway, after about uh, six weeks, two months, and several attempts by the Crown to take over Norfolk to get rid of Robert Kett, and who, but they were then beaten back by the peasants with their pitchforks, uh, after about six weeks, finally an army from all over the country was mustered by the king and sent to put down the rebellion. Uh, and eventually Robert Kett, for his trouble, um, you know, trying to keep the land for the people, was strung up uh, by chains in chains from the uh, walls of Norwich. And all the landowners that had been stealing the land were then let out by the king and allowed to carry on their dirty work. And the ditches... Um, that had been filled in by the peasants. What happened? The fences went up, the ditches went in. Uh, those were all returned uh, by the peasants as part of the revolt. They flattened the land so that uh, the land was open again and all the fences started going up again after the rebellion, uh, the, uh, the Kett's Rebellion in 1649 with Robert Kett. And Kett's Oak, I believe, near Wyndham is still there, actually just no uh, south of Norwich. So uh, we move on now to the English Civil War. Now, the English Civil War in the 1600s started in 1642, ended in 1649, but the, the problems that led to it uh, began in the 1630s. Again, this was King Charles I doing something to try and stop enclosure. Enclosure was seen as something very bad in those days by many people who could see that it was taking away a whole peasant class meaning that these peasants, people who had been landowners, had been able to grow their own food, and have somewhere to live, were uh, actually being taken off the land and being sold into uh, uh, employment. So they had to buy, they had to work for a big landowner in order to get some money to buy some food. At no point was any of the, the, the food that they were growing, the livestock they were working on, no point was it theirs. They didn't have direct access. They had to go through a lord of the manor of some sort. So... Uh, King Charles I uh, actually started fining landowners who were privatising land, started fining the enclosing landowners, quite big fines, uh, and saying to them, well, look, you know, if you don't want to pay the fine, just let the peasants back onto the land. And this was happening in the 1630s. There's many references for this, um, some of which I've put up on the internet, but it's quite an obscure fact. Many people don't realise that this was going on before the English Civil War. So war actually broke out in 1642 between the feudal classes. I mean, some people call it a revolution. Of course, it wasn't. It was a civil war between the two main classes at the time, which was the merchant classes, which we now you would encapsulate with the city of London, and, <coughs> and the feudal classes, the old feudal barons, uh, the dukes, uh, and the lords of the manor across the country were very much divided. Some of them supported the moneyed classes and the enclosers of the land, and others supported the king, people who thought that actually peasants should be able to keep their land and wanted the status quo, a kind of conservative force versus a very radical, let's uh, get everybody off the land, then they can come and work for us. And so ultimately, through the Civil War, the merchants won. And after the English Civil War, there was a rapid acceleration in enclosure. But one thing that did happen during that time was there were a lot of radical th thinkers, a lot of radical thinking going on during the English Civil War. In 1645, which was in the middle of the war, the levellers uh, emerged. They were against the distinctions of class and wealth. They were led by Lieutenant General, uh, Lieutenant General in Com Cromwell's army, John Lilburn, who's also known as Freeborn John, uh, Richard Overton and William Walwyn, who were pamphleteers and writers, saying, well, hang on a minute, if we're going to have a civil war, we want something better at the end of it. We don't want something worse. And they could see it was going that way towards complete control of the country by the merchant classes, by the moneyed people, and that the ordinary people were not going to get uh, much of a say. Uh, there was also the diggers in 1649 under Gerard Winstanley, who said, the earth is a tre common treasury for all. 
Now, Win Stanley was going back in a way to Leviticus, saying, look, the earth everybody needs, the land everybody needs, so let's just use this opportunity to share it out. We've not got the king anymore, uh, and the king was the landowner of all of Britain, so now let's just share out the land. But, of course, that didn't happen. Uh, the merchant classes closed in on uh, Win Stanley and his diggers, who'd taken a bit of common land in St George's Hill in Surrey, which is now a uh, private gated estate. It's like the Beverly Hills of Britain, uh, incidentally, which is ironic since that was where the freedom of the land movement in the Civil War started. Um, and so Win Stanley eventually ended up as a Quaker, but uh, his protest and his pamphlets have gone right down the years. In fact, you can see much of the history of the Civil War is all about this struggle over land uh, and about equality in the country. Uh, actually, it ended up Cromwell and uh, the parliamentarians winning and ignoring all of the calls of the, pe the, calls of the soldiers and the ordinary people who'd fought for him were ignored. Um, and there is a lot of literature about this. After the Second World War, Christopher Hill wrote a book called The World Turned Upside Down. There's a book by Brailsford, which is called The Levellers and the English Revolution, which talks about this. There's very, very little known and taught in history about all this period. But Brailsford's book, book particularly goes into all of the very nitty-gritty detail of what struggles were going on within the army, what this English Civil War was really all about. Um, and uh, there's also a film called Win Stanley, made by Kevin Brownlow in the 1970s. Uh, it was a very interesting film because it was made in black and white, and it was made with all volunteer uh, labour making the film and many volunteer actors, apart from one or two professional actors in the lead role. So that's well worth watching if you want to understand what the English Civil War was really all about. And, of course, it was a very important war historically because it was the first uh, time that... An entire country was controlled by the merchant classes. Now, up until then, you'd had city-states, which were very much like places like Venice uh, and Bristol, who were, you know, not necessarily entirely controlled, but but run to a large extent by the merchants. When the when Cromwell and his faction took over Britain, that was the first time that the uh, that, that, that the merchant classes, in other words, not uh, a king, not a feudal system, had been running the country. And uh, that's one of the reasons why enclosure rapidly increased, because this was very lucrative for the merchants. If they could kick everybody off the land, they had loads of cheap labour, and also they had that land to do what they wanted with. And the reason they managed to do this was because only landowners could vote in Parliament. So basically the peasants were totally disenfranchised uh, and cheated by uh, the English Civil War. Uh, so the diggers and the levellers were probably the two most important uh, important. Um, movements in the Civil War. The other thing is, of course, that this led to mass urbanisation afterwards, Britain and the Industrial Revolution. The fact that we managed, through the Civil War, to kick all the peasants off the land through enclosure meant that you had loads and loads and loads of labourers desperate to work. So yeah, And you also had a division of wealth. You had the factory merchant classes who could build factories. Uh, they had plenty of money to do almost anything they wanted with, and then plenty of very, very cheap labour, these poor peasants who were desperate for a little bit of money to survive, to work for them. So the English Civil War was very, very important, and of course it was one of the reasons why we had the Agricultural Revolution and Industrial Revolution here in Britain, and why that led to the biggest empire the world's ever seen, where we went round taking over bits of the world here, there and everywhere, and became the bullies of the world for a while. Uh, you know, this, this whole uh, prominence of Britain was due to what happened during the English Civil War and the power that the merchants got from the English Civil War. Um, despite a lot of people saying it was a battle over religious ideas, it wasn't at all. It was just a simple power battle. Now, uh, after that was the private banking system. That started after the English Civil War, and we'll talk about that in a minute.